Welcome to the Tepper School of Business Multimedia Series. For more information on the Tepper School at Carnegie Mellon, please visit us at www.tepper.cmu.edu slash multimedia. And now, here's your selected video. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Dick Simmons. Dean Damon, members of the faculty, friends, and family of the graduates, and of course graduates of the Tepper School. The most important thing I will say today is that my remarks will be brief. I am sure that you have more important things to do than to listen to someone who has been asked to describe his career. On the other hand, I do have some thoughts that I'd like to share with you. The lessons I have learned were important to me and played a role in whatever modest success I have achieved. I will try to outline them briefly. And certainly I am honored to be here today to help you celebrate this special day. Indeed, this is a defining moment in your lives, the first day of the rest of your lives, a point in time to reflect, to consider, to ponder what it is you will do in the years to come. At the age of 81, it is only natural for me to reflect on the past 59 years since I graduated as a metallurgist from MIT and came to Pittsburgh to work in a steel mill. The first lesson that I have learned over six decades is that while we would like to believe it otherwise, life is not entirely fair. And it would be unrealistic of me to tell you otherwise. Now what do I mean by that? I mean that some people enjoy a degree of success in life which in a significant way must be attributed to luck or being in the right place at the right time. It is not just who is the brightest or who works the hardest, and it is clear to me that I am one of the luckiest people in the world. I say that in answer to the question, how did you succeed? Having taught at the Tepper School for seven years after retirement from ATI, I have concluded, concluded that you the graduates collectively are all of the best and the brightest. And I am certain that you all worked hard to reach this point. But from this point forward, there are other variables which will determine just how successful each of you will be. What company did you choose to work for? Is the company in a growth mode? What kind of a boss did you have? Do the values of the company make you feel good about working for that organization? In my case, I succeeded because of factors beyond my control. I was made president of Allegheny Ludlam 19 years after I graduated from MIT in 1972. I was 39, young by any measure, and probably not ready for the job. Fast forward to 1980. I was able to buy the company in one of the lar largest leverage buyouts done to that point in December of 1980 because the board of directors des decided it did not want to remain in the specialty metals business. After that, we were able to acquire a number of specialty metals businesses. And when I was made president of ATI, our sales revenue were 500 million. And when I retired 12 years ago, sales revenue was 4 billion. ATI today has revenues of over 5 billion. But there are others who agree with my conclusion about life and luck. For example, Napoleon believed that ability counts for little 
in military men if, big if, they are not also blessed with opportunity. What he wanted most, he said, were lucky generals. In a recent biography of our 34th president, he said, Dwight D. Eisenhower, he said he was lucky that West Point adopted competitive entry in time for him to be selected. His career was res rescued repeatedly by older generals who recognized his ability. It was an almost miraculous career. He was promoted over 228 senior officers when he took over the high command in North Africa in World War II. He had great bosses. So my first bit of advice this morning is to try, if you can, to put yourself in a position to be very, very lucky. Call it lesson one. And that means that you have to try and pick the right company for which to work, try to pick the right bosses to work for, and then you might, with hard work and ability, just might be very lucky. Now, what do I mean by the right boss? Well, I had a boss in Canton, Ohio, at Republic Steel, who was the assistant general manager of a 10,000-man steel-making district, which also made stainless steel and other specialty metals. He was a self-made man. He started at the bottom as a laborer in the lowest job in a steel mill, and he made it to the top in that region. He was made general manager after his boss left, who happened to be the man who recruited me to Republic Steel. And he was asked who he wanted as an assistant general manager. He said Dick Simmons. He was told that he couldn't have Dick Simmons, who was 33. Simmons was too young, and he said, if I can't have Dick Simmons, I don't want the job. He got Dick Simmons. Now here was a man who had reached a point in his career which was far higher than anything to which he had aspired. And he was willing to give it all up to have the man he wanted as his assistant. So as I said, pick the right boss. Surely you will also suffer disappointments in life. Your boss picks someone else for promotion you thought you should have. Or you choose to work for a company which does not do well. But I am not as concerned how you handle failure or disappointment. Most of us learn to handle these moments. You get over it. No, I am more concerned about how you handle success. And some may forget that a large ingredient of success was due to luck. And so I suggest that you should not get too full of yourself when you favor the exquisite taste of success. But for the great roulette wheel in the sky, it could have been someone else. Consider that lesson two. But I must confess that when I look around at those that have achieved success, I have concluded that the harder and smarter that they work, the luckier they seem to be. They look beyond the job they have and try to understand how other jobs are also important to the success of the company. They examine the strategies the company is following and assess them and tell their boss if they believe that the strategy is flawed. That is, if you have the right boss. Call that lesson three. There is another ingredient I see in successful people. They are people who pursue excellence. I believe that success seems to follow excellence. The successful people whom I know are not just bright and hardworking. They have set standards of performance and improvement of which everyone around them wants to be a part. I coined some corny sayings when I was president of Allegheny Ludlam and Allegheny Technologies. One of them is that we will never be any better than we set out to be. And I am delighted to read in the annual report of my old company that the CEO still discusses cost reduction as one of the factors which helps them survive and prosper. If your company is not cost competitive, 
failure will certainly follow. And excellence is a difficult thing to measure, but I know it when I see it. Excellence is that trait that drives people to want to do better, to excel, to beat their best time. And excellence is a difficult thing to measure, but I know it when I see it. And to me, it is inspiring to see it in someone, whether it be in sports or business. Commitment to excellence is a joy to behold. It turns average into outstanding, and I refer you to the recent biography of Steve Jobs by Walter I Isaacson as an example of a man unwilling to accept anything but excellence, sometimes unreasonably so. Call it lesson four. To, serve, to survive in a global economy, it is essential to field your best team. Anything less will inevitably lead to failure. This is affirmative action at its best, fielding your best team regardless of who they are or where they are from. This is one of the most difficult challenges for a CEO. How do we select the right people for each key job? And the answer is we don't always do so. We make mistakes. Recognizing this fact simply means that we must constantly re-examine our best team. Making changes were required. Call it lesson five. Since I graduated from college, the technologies we use to manufacture specialty materials are all different. They did not exist when I graduated. We had to invent them and invest in them. The competition is different, the challenges are different, and if we had not been able to create change, we would not have survived. Most of my U.S. competitors are gone. And change in the future, your future, will continue to come with increasing speed. It is not just change you will have to deal with, it is velocity of change. And when I see successful people, I see people who can deal with ever-increasing velocity of change. Call it lesson six. Each of you will someday be in a position to affect the ethic of the organization in which you work. I promise you that in your lifetime you will be tested. Your honesty, your integrity, your fairness will be challenged. You will set the value standards of your generation, and that is quite a burden. Doing the right thing, as I prefer to call ethics, may put yourself, your job, your security, your next promotion at risk. But rather than talk about ethics, doing the right thing, I would rather tell a story. I use this story in my ethics class for undergraduates, which I teach twice a year. A VP of manufacturing was called by the CEO of a diversified corporation to come to his office. When the VP reached the CEO's office, the CEO said he had received a call from a friend who was president of a company that purchased a lot of stainless steel from Allegheny Ludlam. And the president went on to tell the C my CEO that one of the Allegheny Ludlam service metallurgists had insulted him. The CEO said, I want that man fired. The VP responded by saying that the, he would like to get the facts from the young metallurgist before he took any action. He did, and then went back to the CEO and told him that the problem arose when the customer wanted to reject a sizable quantity of stainless steel sheet. The young metallurgist examined the material and said there is nothing wrong with the material. And for that reason, he could not authorize its return and further that the decision would have to be made by the sales department. The Beef VP of manufacturing said, on the basis of the facts, he could not justify firing this young man who had a great but short history with the company to that point. The CEO said, I don't care. I want this man fired. The VP responded by saying, he is a good employee he has a great future with us. The CEO said, I don't care, fire him. This is the point where the, CB, the VP was looking the tiger in the eye 
as I like to say in my ethics class. How does the VP refuse to do something he has been ordered to do by the CEO? How does the VP do the right thing? And so he said to the CEO, I will not fire him. If you want him fired, you fire him. And the CEO said, you aren't loyal. The VP responded by saying, no, I am loyal. Loyalty is telling your boss something you know he doesn't want to hear. Let me repeat that. Loyalty is telling your boss something you know he doesn't want to hear. The confrontation ended without a decision. The young metallurgist was not fired. Postscript. A year later, the VP was made president of Allegheny Ludlam Steel. I was that VP of manufacturing. The story is true. The takeaway is try to do the right thing and have a great boss. Call that lesson seven. And that story remains as vivid today, even though it happened over 40 years ago. Whenever I am faced with doing the right thing, that story comes to mind. Let me close my remarks by reminding everyone that people like you will be leading our society in the years to come. With that comes responsibility for doing good in the communities where you live and work. Doing good is a responsibility that follows a close second to leading an efficient, profitable company which grows and prospers. Remember, you come into this world with a clean slate. You leave it identified by what you earn over the course of your life. Call that the final lesson. To each of you, I say good luck, God spade, and may you be as lucky as I have been. How much I would like to be where you are today, doing it all over again. Thank you. Thank you.